Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Coffee and Football presented by Austin Underground. I'm your host, Blake Monroe, where I'm joined this morning by Bobby Burton and Jerry Hamilton. And a lot to talk about this morning. Be sure to tell us where you're checking in from, what you're drinking. Obviously, we love to see that. But guys, let's start with spring practice. So, you know, we had the countdown. It finally came yesterday. Y'all were there along with CJ Vogel. He had coverage on On Texas Football along with uh, here on the YouTube channel, of course. But your thoughts, your observations, what you got? Vanderbilt in trouble. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, this is what three straight top five recruiting classes look like uh, in my blue blood working well in the portal. Um, look, there's still some a couple of holes that have to be uh, filled, right? You need an experienced adult in the room over the ball at D-tackle. Uh, see what how punter kind of works out. Ian Ratliff is a good – he's a power five level punter. Uh, but, you know, you have the freshman coming in, Michael Kern, do, you do something on the portal there. Because Ryan Sanborn was a key addition to the team last year. Uh, but would you look around, Bobby, and Sark was uh, Sark was pretty giddy for spring practice. He was a pretty confident coach yesterday. We were all – you – Myself and C.J. Vogel were all there for that entire press conference. And Sarks, he was confident in the last year. He's just as confident at his press conference after day one. Here, here's the reality. He has reason to be confident. They've got some dudes running around out there. Yeah, that's what I would say to you, Jerry, after after watching the first practice uh, yesterday. Um, Jerry, I, the overwhelming feeling. I, I mentioned this going into it yesterday and then coming out of it as well athleticism ability it's there i mean they've got it yeah uh, they they've got some pieces that they need to complete this team with i do believe they have uh some issues at defensive tackle uh Sadir mitchell has not come on like you would want him to uh alex january looked good but still he's young uh so i think that they need to go to the portal for that but man i i, I gotta be honest with you this this is starting to feel and look like it did in the aughts. I'm just, I was there for that. I was, I watched the, I watched it from the, the beginning to the end. It feels like that. It looks like that on the field, period, full stop. Um, I would say that if you're looking at a position to talk about the health of the football team right now, the offensive line is where I would start because that is, it is very indicative of, of the program as a whole, Jerry and Blake. And here's what I mean by that. It's not just one guy. Yes, they have a superstar there in, in Kelvin Banks, but they have multiple other NFL players and they're deep. Yes. That is that checks every box that you would want. And it's not a small number. Like, oh, well, they have two, two or two legit NFL quarterbacks right now for sure. And Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning, in my opinion. That's not even a question. Okay. But you know, they got 17, 18 offensive linemen. That is a deep room and it is a talented room. Yeah. So you're starting to talk about a, a position or a position group that requires a lot of numbers. It, 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 uh, it looks as good as it's going to look, uh, in my opinion. They might get better over time uh, as they become more and more picky in recruiting. But I'm just telling you, um, they are there. They are there physically. Uh, I don't know if they're going to be there f that, you know, I don't know. I said this yesterday. I don't know if they're going to be 12 and 0 or anything like that. I don't know if they're going to be nine and three, 10 and one, uh, 10 and two, 11 and what, whatever. I know they've got the, the pieces to be competitive in every football game they play. No competitive doubt. In every football game they play, uh, you know, whoever it may be, they, they've just got some guys. Uh, by, uh, by the way, Blake broke the breaking news. Uh, Brandon Huey's back. We had breaking news this morning. Brandon <laughs> Huey's back. You already brought that up. I was going to break the news, uh, but uh, uh, glad you're back, man. Uh, we've had people check in from Oahu and Madrid. I'm jealous of both of you. Maybe y'all are jealous because we're in Austin watching spring football, too. I don't, maybe that goes both ways right now. Uh, th there's Brandon Huey. I once saw Brandon Huey run a 4 7 on Bevo Boulevard to uh, get down there when the team got off the bus. It was very impressive. Um, <laughs> but uh, I love meeting all you guys on Bevo Boulevard. Uh, and we'll, we'll be down there for the spring game. Uh, but, yeah, you know, look, I mean, it, here's the crazy thing. And, and I guess it's the new shiny toys part of this, right? But when C.J. Vogel and I, we did recruiting breakdown yesterday, we talked about what was going on in recruiting. But then we also talked about the freshmen in their first practice. 
because those were the most recent recruits. And I gave Ryan Wingo the MVP yesterday. And I think it's because it's the new shiny toy, and that's the first time we got to see it. But look, and Rod Babers, we were talking about with CJ last night on Longhorn Livestream. There's an extra gear some guys have. Roy Williams had it. When the ball is in the air and it's time to go make a play on that ball, locate ball and go make a play on the ball. Ryan Wingo showed that yesterday multiple times. So you're just like, hmm, that's a little different. It's one thing to be for a 6'2", 205-pound receiver, 208, to be quick off the line, be able to accelerate, be able to decelerate, be able to create separation and accelerate again. But then there's the final piece to that race for a wide receiver is tracking a football. And when you can do that on top of everything else and you have size and you have long arms, you have a chance to be a big-time player. And I don't want to overhype it, guys, but we'll have to let it play out. But that guy, uh, he looked the part. He's got some tools. Yeah, uh, he, He's got some tools. I will say this. Uh, he is a lot like Adonai Mitchell, size-wise. Maybe a little bit thicker. Uh, definitely a little bit thicker than than Adnai, uh, but has that same acceleration downfield where he can pull away from people twenty yards into his route. He doesn't have to beat you off the ball. He can beat you late with his speed. Um, and I, I would say that he's as good a prospect at receiver. He may not have the impact as Xavier Worthy had because Xavier Worthy was a one man gang at some level at receiver as a freshman. Uh, but he is as good a receiver prospect as Texas has signed since Roy Williams, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, so anybody that didn't have him a five-star got it wrong. I'll just put it that way. Uh, he he has a chance if he continues th that he would go, he can go as high as he wants in the NFL draft. I'll just put it that way. Um, guys, the, the other one that I would say to you, uh, some other guys that, that look good, uh, Colin Simmons, we talked about, Alex January, I thought looked really, really good. Uh, maybe the most pleasant surprise of the freshman was Jordan Washington. Uh, looked really, really That's good yesterday. Uh, looked good running, looked fluid running routes, by the way. Uh, it, it's, he's going to be a guy that I think might get some time this year as, as a true freshman. Might. And then the, the bodies of the two running backs were like – Hilarious. Jer Jarrett Gibson looks like a pro from the waist up. Okay. He's he, built like Blake Corum for those that are wondering. He's built like yeah, Blake Corum. Maybe even better. Yeah. I mean, it's, Blake Corum has some, he, he's built, but he doesn't have that stocky shoulder thing. Um, Christian Clark is built like a pro from the waist down <laughs> already. And it, so it's very, very uh, interesting. Uh, about as well. We saw uh, Ber Vernon Broughton yesterday. Brandon's asking about him. Saw Vernon. Alfred Collins was out there. Probably the only negative that we saw at, of all practice for me was Sadir Mitchell being told to go take a lap, you know, and being told that, hey, it's, you know, it's a different sheriff in town. Time for you to get off your, you know what. Uh, so uh, that was, that was good stuff. Um, I look, it, I think that. My, my opinion is is no different. They have good good freshmen. The sophomores, Jelani McDonald looked terrific. I thought I, Andrew McCuba yesterday looked good in coverage. Jerry, I saw him pick up a couple things in front of his eye. You know what I mean? That they, they flashed in front of him. He picked up immediately uh, quicker than Keaton Crawford, uh, for example, uh, just so, so you, you know. Um, but all in all, good stuff. Hey, today's show uh, brought to you guys – uh, by Rick Vavro and his team at Austin Underground. Uh, Austin Underground is a uh, commercial construction company that really tries to do its best for people in and around Austin. Since 2004, they have specialized in difficult underground commercial installations. The team's engineering background gives Austin Underground the ability to perform work other firms often consider too risky. Rick Vavro and his team offer end-to-end -end client experience, including seamless communication, budgeting, staffing, and top-notch trade partners. And most importantly, they produce solid quality work each and every time. That's Austin Underground.
A, a couple things I want to add to what Bobby said. Uh, by the way, uh, Jordan Washington's dad was on our YouTube uh, the other day commenting. He said he wrestled with Jordan when he was home. Uh, I guarantee you he lost. Okay? <laughs> if he's here and wants to come back and say he didn't, he can. But I, I think Jordan got him based on what he I said, said. He said no comment when you said okay, that. Okay, that, so he lost. Okay, <laughs> clearly. But what, what impressed me about Jordan yesterday was, it, look, it was a simple blocking drill, right? But – it's the how low with leverage his athletic ability allowed him to come off the ball. It was the lowest of any tight end as far as coming off the ball and striking. And I thought that was so interesting to me. It's not surprising, but you hadn't really seen it on that level, right? Todd Thompson at Langham Creek did a great job with Jordan Washington. He made him be a, tie, a true tight end and didn't just split him out wide for the betterment of his team. He actually developed the kid as a tight end. Uh, so he needs credit for that, a former Rice fullback that's a really good high school coach in Texas. But Jordan Washington's ankle flexion, knee bend, hip flexibility, all three of those things showed in that one drill. I actually posted a photo of it on, on Texas Football this morning, and you can see if low man wins, that low man has a chance to win in the blocking as a blocker, in addition to being a long-arm pass catcher that can stretch the seam of the football field. So uh, he, he was impressive yesterday. His body's still, you know, he's 240, but he's got a lot left. I mean, he may, he's going to be a 255, 260 pound guy. Um, I jokingly said last night is if anybody's seen that photo of Saquon Barkley on the tee box hitting the driver, um, Blake, I don't know if you could bring that up. If you could search that, that's what Christian Clark looks like in his lower body uh, as a freshman. I mean, he looks like a 30 year old guy. Um, but he looks like a 30-year-old guy from the waist down. He has got a really good running back frame. Somebody mentioned uh, – uh, somebody has been mentioning uh, Xavier Filsamy. He looked very good physically yesterday. A thicker guy than even Andrew Makuba. Somebody asked about Makuba versus Catalong. I think Makuba is a big – there. so that, there you go. That's Christian Clark teeing off. At top golf, okay, that's what he, Bobby. That's what his lower body looks like, right? It, definitely the thought. I think he may have bigger calves than Saquon Barkley. Yeah, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I mean, that's Saquon Barkley, right? In that photo. Yes. yes. Yeah, I think Christian Clark may have bigger calves. That's crazy. Now, now maybe not as well defined, right. but bigger. Yeah. Now he is built. I mean, I expected Savion Red to look like a tank. It wasn't Savion Red that looked like a tank. It was Christian Clark. That's that's what I now Savion Red has a bigger upper body and stuff right now because he's more well developed. But yeah, that was that was impressive. Um, hey, we, we also got other things going on. Basketball team, Jerry. Uh, they they uh, they've got they figured out who their opponent was. We've got pro day coming up today. You and I will be there as well as CJ. And then there's some recruiting news. We got a lot of stuff coming up uh, for today. It's a it's an interesting one. Um, hey, yeah, uh, the the pro day today, Jerry. Um, Quinn Ewers, I, I confirmed yesterday, is going to throw again today uh, right. for this one. So we'll be able to see him a little bit more this afternoon. Uh, we talked to Tavondre Sweat. You and I talked to Tavondre Sweat and Jonathan Brooks a little bit yesterday after practice. Uh, said hello to those guys. They were out fooling around uh, with the Longhorns. Uh, just two really high quality guys representing the the Longhorns. By the way. Uh, couldn't couldn't wait to be around practice and football again. Uh, so very good stuff there. By, by the way, some questions there. Pro day begins at twelve forty five. Uh, we will have coverage from it. We're going to have a live uh, show after. We're going to talk about it, Bobby and myself. Uh, the pro day will also be tape delayed on Longhorn Network late tonight. I don't know if it's eight or eight nine. o'clock. Eight o'clock tonight. So uh, we'll we'll keep we'll have you covered uh, at the pro day after the pro day, and then if you want to watch that tonight, it will be on Longhorn Network at eight. O'clock. Uh, yeah, basketball. Look, Texas will play Colorado State. I'm still not sure if Virginia scored since the eight minute mark in that game. I mean, golly, I know Virginia fans got their national championship, and congrats to Tony Bennett for winning one. But God dang, has it been ugly since then? I mean, that's the slowest possessions per game in college basketball on a year to year basis. Even Kelvin Sampson's up got an uptick to 66 and a half, where Tony Bennett's remained in the 63 64 range. But Virginia is very tough to watch. They couldn't score the ball inside eight feet. They can't throw it to the post. 
Um, and so if their guards shoot 20%, they're going to score a very low number, which they did. I think Texas is a better basketball team than Colorado State. Does that mean Colorado State can't beat Texas? No, it absolutely doesn't. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm going to I'm staying on the same train. I mean, we'll get into some things about the game. You know, Virginia plays that pack line defense, so they were going to take away the three. Um, that created some straight line drives for Colorado State because Virginia doesn't have good rim protection behind it. Um, and Ratliff, their 6'6 guard, he, he could finish right and left handed. He got some good straight line drives. Uh, they had an undersized big Colorado State that played some bully ball with good feet around the rim. Uh, but what Virginia did well was they slowed down Stevens, the point guard from Allen, Texas, who played on a state title team at Allen, who is Colorado State's best player. Virginia's plan was to take him away. The rest of those guys got Virginia because Virginia wasn't making any shots at all. I don't think Virginia's game plan was bad. They just can't score the basketball. Um, and and I, I think that's probably a bad sign for the ACC and the NCAA tournament for those filling out brackets that Virginia went 13 and seven in the ACC and they suck on offense. They're hey, not good. Jerry, you and I were watching the game together last night. Is Texas – like I thought – the what I what I saw is I saw a Colorado State team that was long. They're fairly long on defense. And they were making all these back cuts successfully to the basket. It's, yeah. by, by playing that pack line defense that you're talking about, that Virginia plays, does, Texas doesn't play that type of defense, so they won't be as susceptible to those back cuts. Well, I think Texas has more rim protection and better athletes. I think they can okay. recover and rotate better. Uh, okay. But, look, I, I, I'm on the same train with Texas, and, I, and I'm and i not ragging on the guy. I'm not. Tyrese Hunter has to show up. I mean, bottom line, I think D-Sue will have a – D-Sue and Asmus will play well, right? The, the key with Texas is can you get the ball out of Asmus's hands at 28 feet? If you can do that, which very few teams can, U of H has the coach and personnel to do that. Uh, but you saw in other games, teams couldn't do that, right? Baylor had no chance to do that, and they played zone and whatever. If you can get the ball out of Acemas's hands outside of 25 feet, then Disu catches it at 22 feet, 23 feet in the ball screen game. That's a good place to be defensively. Then if the ball gets to Tyrese Hunter, what's he going to do with it in that scenario? Tyrese Hunter has to play well for Texas to win in the NCAA tournament. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Um, and we don't, we're not asking Tyrese to have an Oklahoma career night. But what we are saying is you ha can't have the three offers. You got to be in between. There has to be two. If, if Texas can get two good games in a row from Tyrese Hunter and Acemas and Disu play close to their capability, um, Texas should beat Colorado State and they should give Tennessee a heck of a game. Hey, before we move on, guys, I'm going to put this up here one more time. If you haven't entered the On Texas Football Bracket Challenge, you can actually pull out your phone if you're watching on, you know, whatever, and scan that QR code right there, or I'll put the link in the chat here in just a second. But enter that. Uh, before the games begin, you get $200 from the 40 Acres Collection by 40 Acres Apparel. We want to thank them for sponsoring that. That's a heck of a prize for a first place. Yeah. Yep. Hey, it's not two hundred dollars. It's two hundred dollars worth of gear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two hundred dollars <laughs> of the forty acres collection. I guess I should say two hundred dollars of the forty acres collection of from forty acres apparel. Let me let me word that a little bit better. Thank you. By, by, by the way, I want to add. As somebody said, to watch the women's team. I actually, uh, after the practice yesterday, I hung out in the uh, hoops facility a little bit and did some work. What women's team was getting ready for practice? Um, confident group. I'll say that. Hey, you saw, you, you saw somebody else at the basketball facility, too. Yeah, I guess it's yeah. time to get into some recruiting. Uh, Texas offered the third 2026 quarterback uh, that they have yesterday, and that was uh, Dia Bell uh, out of Plantation American Heritage. If you haven't heard of American Heritage before, you don't. You, you got to brush up on your recruiting. That's a school down in South Florida. If you go to their wiki page, there's about eight NFL players and about 15 Major League Baseball players. Uh, but this is uh, – Bell right here had a really good um, sophomore season. He actually played varsity as an eighth grader. You can in Florida if the camp junior middle school and high school campuses are on the same campus. So he played a little bit in eighth grade. There you see the athleticism, the footwork. Uh, really good player on the move. Uh, got big hands the way he pats the ball. Uh, got good timing. But here's the fun part about him. Raja Bell is his father. Uh, those that followed the NBA, Rajah Bell was about a as competitive and tough defender at the guard position as, as you'll ever see. So if he passed that along to his son, 
His son's going to be one hell of a competitor. Uh, but I did see uh, the the Bell family. They they took a tour through the basketball facility yesterday. I think he has a younger brother. Look like, uh, and when I say younger, look like maybe middle school kid uh, that's about six two, six three. Uh, so they were they were went through the basketball facility with that visit. They were out at the uh, practice yesterday as well. Uh, he has a Spurs fan. I hated Raja. There you go. Uh, but like I said, uh, if his if his son's got his competitive fire, then uh, uh, Texas offered the right guy. But Bobby, you can see the skill set there. I mean, he falls in line uh, w- w- with what Sark's recruiting at quarterback. I love the feet. I love his feet, Bobby. Yeah, it, look, I mean, Sark's not. He's just not going to miss on quarterbacks, dude. I mean, I think we need to we need to like circle that and ex, put an exclamation point next to it, et cetera. Uh, just a, a tremendous prospect in, in general. I think that, you know, Sark, this is one of the things that just pickles me uh, as a long, life, lifetime Longhorn. They, they've got he's got the most important position on the field wired. He's got a third year starter coming back. He's got Arch Manning as a backup. He's got K.J. Lacey. And Trey Owens waiting in the wings, maybe other guy. I mean, this this is the next group. It just it's going to be a never ending thing for him. And you know, and, and I, to your point, to add, if you have good quarterbacks, receivers are going to follow. Why wouldn't they? And a good offensive scheme. Yeah, that, that that's my whole point to set it all up. And so you're going to win some games, and you're going to play in some in some interesting games, right? And uh, look. Uh, I, I like him a lot. I, I, I like the guy out of uh, California uh, as well. I mean, there's there's a number of different players here that I think they could go to at quarterback. Yeah, uh, but they're going to be involved with guys like this Dia Bell, who can throw it around, can move around, uh, can do a lot of different things, and, and has the pedigree too. By the way, you talk about uh, another uh, you know notch in in uh, Steve Sarkeesian's belt. You know, you can't tell me that Roger Bell doesn't see Arch Manning going to Texas and saying that might be a place for my son. You know, if, if the Mannings have been there, done that, and they're sending their kid to Texas, uh, maybe a pro athlete might want to do that as well. So that that's all of that makes sense to me. Hey, look like by the way, it looked like Roger was impressed with the Texas basketball facility yesterday, which I obviously he wanted to take a look at when he was there. <laughs> I don't think there's any doubt. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean. Texas has offered three quarterbacks in the 26 class, and let's lay this out. Diabelle was on campus yesterday. Troy Hoon out of uh, San Marcos Mission Hills in California, he'll be on campus April 6th. He also camped last summer. Uh, he was the second offer. Jared Curtis out of the Nashville area, uh, some consider him the best prospect in the country in that class. We'll see how things shake out there. Yeah, he's coming in April 13th. Um, his, his mom confirmed that to me uh, last week. Then – there's a Will Griffin out of Tampa Jesuit, who if Texas offers another guy that may be him, um, guy with 11-inch hands. I mean, golly, that's a good starting spot, right? He's been starting since eighth grade at Tampa Jesuit. He's coming in uh, April 13th as well. He was also in town uh, January 20th for junior day. So those seem to be the four out-of-state quarterbacks right now. They're now up to three offers. We'll see if Will Griffin makes four. April 13th, but look, that's the uh, that's the area Texas recruiting in, in quarterback. I mean, and I'll say this, if you're an in-state quarterback, there's a lot of guys and they're, a lot, they're really good players. You got to be very, very high into the young age right now. I mean, there's some really good quarterbacks in 26 in Texas, and Texas offered three guys out of state so far. Hey, Jerry, real quick, at, Champ Bailey says, out of all the 26 quarterbacks offered, which one do you think has the highest ceiling? I need some time on that. I want to see these guys a little bit more. Um, the spring practice coming up. Um, I, I, I'm going to be down in Florida for a week. I'm going to go see Bell in person, uh, see some other guys. So get, give me, ask me that again in mid-May after I've seen these guys in the spring. I, I don't want to make the call too early there. There you go. All right, Bobby, before we get uh, back and talk a little I, bit I, more. I want to mention one more recruiting thing, Blake. Uh, Nick Brooks, one of the top offensive linemen in the country in 2025. I think we have Nick Brooks. Here's Nick Brooks, all 6'7", 350 of him, out of Des Moines, Iowa, JFK High School there. I spoke with him yesterday. He's a one-time Iowa commit that doesn't like other players in Iowa, clearly. Um, and uh, he's a one-time Iowa commit that backed off of that commitment. Kyle Flood went to see him in January, and that's pretty much given up a full day on the road. And, okay, man, he plays without his helmet. Play through the whistle, young man. Um, and – you know, so when Kyle Flood went to see him, 
that kind of I raised an eyebrow. I was like, wow, because I know you're giving up an entire day of travel to go see an offensive lineman in Iowa. And everybody just said he was a lock to Iowa. He backed off his Iowa commitment in November. He's been to Georgia twice. Um, and he told me yesterday on the phone he'll be in Austin April 20th for the spring game, and he's going to be back for a June official visit. I think Iowa, you know, especially with Caden Proctor, the reports that he's already leaving Iowa, going back to Alabama, I think Iowa's got some issues. Now, Iowa's going to get the last official visit, June 21st through 23rd. Maybe they'll prove me wrong. He's going to Georgia May 31st through June 2nd for an official visit. But Texas was one of the three schools that Nick Brooks mentioned yesterday that he for sure will make an official visit. Not only that, Texas is going to get two visits. So Kyle Flood went out there for a reason. You don't give up a full day in recruiting in January to go see one guy with that type of travel. There you see some body quickness, Bobby, at, at tackle there. Large human with good feet. Yeah, he's going to be a guard that's going to maul people. Yes. That's what he looks like to me. My goodness. And um, I, think he's a so long, I think he's a long shot wild card for Texas. But if you get him on campus twice, let's see what uh, happens. Have, that's what happened with uh, Brandon Baker. 6'7", 350. That's yes. what they look like. <laughs> I don't know what else to say other than that. I wouldn't want to have that uh, that food bill. I'll put it you, that you, know, yeah, you know a guys are really good in the state of Iowa when a Georgia, Texas, Alabama come up and recruit you. Yeah, because absolutely. there's plenty of large humans around the country that are closer. Yep. All right, y'all. Before we move on, Bobby, I'm going to let you tell folks out there about our newest sponsor, Autograph.io. Yeah, absolutely. Big news, Longhorn fans. We're excited to be working with Autograph, uh, a company that's been co-founded by the GOAT himself, Tom Brady. Uh, Autograph is where real Texas fans can get real or can get unreal rewards. It's the first app, and this is the interesting part, to track and reward fans for loving what they love most, turning passion of their team into access and experiences. Founded on the belief that devotion should be rewarded and the future of fandom belongs to the fans. They've been sending true fans to the biggest games in college basketball for just $16. Yes, $16. So as we gear up for football season, this means you can score discounted tickets to marquee matchups this coming year. Scan to download the app today on the on the screen. Just scan that. Go to and it will allow you to download the app for free. It's a free app, the Autograph app in the Apple App Store and use referral code on Texas. That's referral code on Texas and see where fandom takes you. Uh, thank you for sponsoring autograph.io. It's again, it's in the Apple App Store. Use code on Texas. All right, we want to thank them for sponsoring. And guys, we got a lot of questions to get let's to. Get it. So we might as well go ahead and start getting to them here. Uh, let's start with the super chat from one of our loyal watchers from Derek Wiser. He says, Good morning. How did that Wiser kid look yesterday? That's quite the photo, by the way, on the uh, on the waiver. Uh, oh, yeah, that is like it's got a ski a sea do there. Hey, uh, so I was actually talking to someone this morning, uh, Derek, about Trey. Um, and I thought he looked really, really bouncy again. Uh, I was told that he has had uh, a phenomenal dedication to being a better player. Um, and a lot of times guys can either sink or swim this time, this time in this, at this point in their career, right? They go up or they go down because you know, he's sitting behind some good players right now, but he hasn't thrown in the towel on that by any stretch. Um, and so I, he's going to be a, a factor this year for sure on special teams. And I'm telling you, I think he could be a Keelan Robinson type player for Texas this year. But I actually think as a running back, he has much more upside than Keelan does long term. I agree. Uh, I, I think that's he's it, look, he caught the ball really, really well. Like, I think Texas does, doesn't take running backs that don't catch the ball well, by the way. Um, that, that's just not something to shard choice and Steve Sarkeesian are going to do. Uh, Jaden Blue looked terrific catching the ball. Trey Wisner looked terrific catching the ball yesterday, too. So he, he ran about four different routes, didn't drop a one. Uh, a couple of them were away from his body, so he, he caught with his hand. I mean, it's just he's a good player. I, there is no telling where he will end up a year from now. I, I'll just put it that way, because I think he could end up being RB1 
a year or two years from now and replace Jaden Blue if Blue continues to to perform and ends up trying to test the NFL waters after this year. And, and I and I would say the other thing is, look, he, he's a great – you have to have – Sark said it. He doesn't like to recruit two running backs that are same in the, in the same yep. class. Christian Clark and Jarrett Gibson were somewhat like that. But, you know, I, I think what – when you look at the running back room at Texas, Christian Clark, Jarrett Gibson, a Cedric Baxter, they all fit the inside zone scheme. So who's going to be – your change of pace guy. You you can have uh, just look Jaden Blue, and I know people th- say this is crazy for he, he's more of your number two change of pace guy from your uh, offensive run game scheme is what I'm talking about. And you can be a tremendous player in that uh, in itself. So Trey Weiser has a chance to be just like that. He's a sleek running back build. He's built more like a big wide receiver. Um, he, he's not going to have that body that Christian Clark has. Right. So what is he what is he what can he do best? I think Sark's going to put him in a position to do what he does best, similar to what he's doing with Jaden Blue. And that's get him in space. That's use him as a receiver um, and, and be that guy that once Texas goes away from that inside zone with more of those downhill between the tackle runners have a guy or two that can be really good football. And those guys can have careers in football. I, I want to say this, neither – and the other thing that, that I think he has, that Trey has right now, he has some space between him and the next guy that's going to be a similar type player yeah. because neither Clark nor Gibson fit that role. Yeah. You, you know what I mean by that, Jerry? No, no. Weisner has that change of pace from the, 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 the last two classes. He is the change of pace back for sure. So he has that, he has that path uh, that I think makes a lot of sense for him. Well, guys, let's talk about another running back. Too broke to pay attention. Says, how did Jarek look physically yesterday? Uh, like he's ready for Power Five football. I mean, I, I I've seen him a few times. Whether it was at IMG in high school, Under Armour game in in December, and he's a guy that's always been physically advanced. You know, he one running backs that come out of Florida are physical kids. By the way, um, and Cedric Baxter had some injury issues, just nagging stuff last year. But he's he's a physical football player. I saw it in person. Um, Jarrett Gibson is a physical in between the tackles runner, uh, with really good feet and 5'10, 2'10, 215, where he's going to fluctuate in that area. Uh, but very strong in the upper body, very strong in the lower body, proportioned well. Um, look, he, he, the whole thing with him to me is Blake Corum had tremendous feet, um, bouncing around from gap to gap. If Jarrett Gibson shows that then uh, he's going to be a tremendous running back. All right, guys, this next question here, when y'all were talking about the receivers, it made a lot of questions pop up. So let's talk about receivers. Naaman Roberts says, great morning, guys. Reporting from New Caney, Texas. I love all our receivers, but it's Bond, Cook, and Wingo for me as the starters. Is Wingo as ready as Worthy was when you scouted him? Well, so I I can't go there on Wingo yet because – the, He's it's not the route runner worthy was. It, it's a He's complex offensive system to me. I mean, you saw it took it's taken John Taycook a, a while to get that terminology and take it to the field. I mean, you, you just look back to the Iowa State game when John Tank came in the game and he didn't get lined up right. That was game 10, right? Of the season 9 10. Um, and Sark immediately pulled him off the field. So the key for Wingo is as tremendous as he looked yesterday as a just a talented wide receiver. It's how quickly you pick up that scheme. Is Sark can Sark trust trust you in that scheme pre-snap because he's got a lot of experienced guys. He's got an experienced quarterback, experienced offensive line, enough experience at running back. He can't have receivers pre-snap that are causing issues. So that's going to be the big piece for Worthy. If he if he passes that test, he's going to play a lot. You're not going to be able to keep him off the field. Uh, but the starters, I think it's hard to say since Silas Bolden isn't here. So we're guessing on some level. I think Silas Bolden, he's Sil- Silas is 5'8, 165. The chip on his shoulders, 5'10, 180. Okay. So that's what this guy's coming in. He's coming in to compete. Uh, but I think Isaiah Bond for sure. Uh, DeAndre Moore is the first guy out in the slot yesterday. John Tay Cook. Uh, those are your three guys. Matthew Golden had, you know, he's been, a, he was limited for a while. He had a boot on Bobby Burton reported there. Um, so, but he was back full go yesterday. 
Um, so, you know, I think Matthew Golden's going to be a starter on this football team. And we'll, it remains to see what Silas Bolden will do. But I think you have six guys this year. Rod Babers calls it Sark Circle, a trusted receiver. It's a very tight circle. It's been three or four. It's going to expand the five or six this year. I, I will say this. Uh, uh, difference between Ryan, Ryan Wingo and Xavier Worthy is Ryan Wingo is not the route runner that Xavier White Worthy was at the same time frame. Xavier Worthy had – he had he had some electric feet and really prioritized that. And then he was the, you know, vertical threat. Uh, Ryan Wingo, what he has is he's much bigger body. I mean, he looks like, you know, one, he looks like a young defensive end. He doesn't look like a young wide receiver. I'll, I'll put that's, that's maybe the best way to put it to you. Uh, but he runs like Adonai Mitchell and, and maybe a little bit better. Uh, and Ad and I just ran a 4-3-5 at the, at the combine. I'm just telling you. Now, to Jerry's point, is he ready to go? I don't know. Um, of those guys that y'all just mentioned, I'll, I'll put it out there. Uh, Matthew Golden had a solid day yesterday. He is a little bit of a silent assassin, yes. in my point, uh, mm -hmm. in, my, in my thought. Catches everything, clean route runner. Um, not necessarily a guy that you think and look at and say, oh, he's going to beat me but he beats people, okay? Uh, the one that I was probably most impressed with that has been counted out, that has been counted out, in my opinion, is DeAndre Moore. Um, he was the first person on the practice field yesterday. CJ told us, uh, talked about that yesterday, and I completely, you know, that, that's just one of, that's a big thing for me. Like Jordan Whittington and Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Worthy were the first people out to practice last year. Now you have a guy like DeAndre Moore who's fighting for a role. He is the best route runner on the team right now. No doubt. Smooth, um, smooth. smooth. Ultra smooth route runner. He's going to find a way. Uh, it would be my – He's and, and he's quick and he's fast. He's not slow by any stretch. And I say that because a lot of, a lot of people – oh, well, Casey Kane was a good route runner. Yeah, but Casey Kane wasn't fast and he was kind of herky-jerky, right? DeAndre Moore smooth, like silky smooth. And those guys are always underrated coming out of breaks with their speed and acceleration because it's such a smooth move. It's like the left-handed shooter in bath. It's so smooth you underrate their speed. Very natural catcher of the pass. Uh, I, very natural cast catcher, uh, pass catcher. Uh, no doubt about that. Um, I, look, he the, the only person I saw a drop yesterday from was Jonte Cook. Of, of the receivers. And I, you know, I, I saw a drop from Parker Livingstone too. I should say that who actually looks like he has as expected some downfield speed. Um, and so did they have a great day yesterday? I don't know about that. Uh, I was told post-practice uh, that uh, Ryan Wingo had a circus catch over the middle at one point, uh, one handed kind of stab about 25 yards downfield. So <laughs> that my point being, I think that, Jerry's right. I think Rod's right. I think that there's going to be a, a, a broadening of the circle of trust. And I will say this, uh, Jerry's talked about this prior and I agree with it. Part of that fact will, part of the factoring in of that will be the idea that Quinn Ewers is in year three. Yeah. As opposed to just year one where yeah. he know he needs to rely on three guys and he can't correct them. He has to be being corrected by the people on the field himself. Now he can actually be the leader. Uh, I want to say this too. Quinn yours looked better uh, yesterday, uh, more physical. He threw the best downfield ball he's thrown since he's been at Texas multiple times. Uh, a lot of times last year, I thought he, uh, I, th I thought he brought rain with deep balls. I'll just be honest. Like he threw moon balls, right? Or he underthrew guys. Um, his footwork is better. His trajectory, guys, on deep balls, much, much better. So part of Quinn's problem has been he's been late or he's, he hasn't seen the right trajectory on deep balls. Yesterday, he was nailing them. He threw about four or five in a row absolutely perfect with the right trajectory to Isaiah Bond on two of them, by the way, and just looked terrific. So um, my point being uh, that I think that I think that the receiver group is going to be helped and widened by the experience of Quinn Ewers and their own ability. 
Like there are more talented receivers than Texas has had. And did Texas really have more than three or four receivers last year? They really didn't. They had a freshman. Right. Jonte Cook was number four. DeAndre Moore was number five as freshmen. Yeah. So are you going to trust those guys in a no. national championship playoff? Not if you think well, you're good. You? No. Not if you have three NFL guys playing in front of you. Yeah. It's a, it's a different story now. Uh, Trace Crutchfield has total number of players on the team right now. I believe we're at the 85 number. Silas Bowl will be 86. Four guys still coming in. So y'all can do the math. Yep. Yeah. And there will be another D tackle out of the portal probably. Uh, hopefully, too. All right, Jerry, if you're ready, I'm going to let you let you tell folks out there about Factor. Man, look, I stole this read from Bobby because I need Factor in my life. Uh, <laughs> I got to tell you, eating better is easy with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian approved and ready to go in just two minutes. You'll have over 35 different options to choose from every week including Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Also, there are more than 60 add-ons to help you stay fueled up and feeling good all day long. Man, do I need that. What are you waiting for? Get started and get after your goals. Two-minute meals fuel, fuel up fast with Factors restaurant-quality meals that are ready to heat and eat wherever you are. That could be pancakes, smoothies, and more. Discover a wide variety of easy options for the entire day, like breakfast, midday bites, and more. No prep, no meal, no messy meals. Factor meals are ready to heat and eat. So there's no prepping, cookie, cooking. I said cookie. See, I need more of these meals. <laughs> cooking or cleanup needed. Flexible for your schedule. Get as much or as little as you need by choosing your meals every week. Plus, you can pause and reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, premium options with no cooking required. Sign up and save. We've done the math. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. Head to factormeals.com slash, slash Texas50 and use code Texas50 to get 50% off. That's code Texas50 at factormeals.com slash Texas50 to get 50% off. I need more factor meals in my life. <laughs> and Savion Red might want to mention. <laughs> it's terrible. I was talking to somebody that feeds the, the kids every so often uh, yesterday when we were walking around campus, et cetera, uh, uh, Jerry. And uh, he was telling us about Sunday nights, how, uh, sometimes the the big guys, Byron Murphy and those guys would come in there and try to take home all these chicken wings and everything else, uh, et cetera, on Sunday nights. And the dietitian for the University of Texas would be in there taking taking plates away as they were leaving. They he wouldn't let them take their stuff away. So Texas actually does, uh, if for, for people wanting to know, the dietitian at Texas apparently <laughs> is a guy that stays on these guys pretty hard. Yeah, it's a, it a little bit of a funny story. I mean, like, is that not the most underrated job in a, in, in a blue blood college football program? Because these guys now have more money, right? I mean, so there is a the more diet, means for excess. More means yes. for excess. Yeah. Yes, I mean, there's always if you walk into the Texas basketball facility or football facility. If you go into the nutrition area, I mean, there's everything you want there. So you can go in any time and grab stuff, right? So your nutritionist, um, th they have a big job, uh, especially if you're recruiting a lot of large humans. I'll say that. Hey, guys, one thing that we need to talk about that we failed to mention at the onset of the show is Texas baseball won a game yesterday against Air Force. They won that one six to five thanks to uh, Dre Kennedy on a walk-off hit with bases loaded in the bottom of the 10th. It looked bleak at the beginning. They ended up making it work. Game two, I believe, I want to say starts at four today, I believe. And then, obviously, Texas Pro Day will be televised after that. But shout-out to the baseball team. That was a tough, gritty win. It seems like it always is against Air Force. But good job there to come from behind. and win. Jerry, maybe after Pro Day, we walk over to uh, Dish Falk and uh, catch a little baseball. How about that? Because Pro Day should go from about 12.45 today. Jerry and I will be there until around 3.30, I think. Uh, some players will run. Keelan Robinson, Jordan Whittington, Jalen Ford. Uh, I'm not sure 
exactly what some guys will be doing. Some uh, Someone asked in the chat earlier who all is going to be participating. We don't know. They don't give you a roster list ahead of time, although I did do some checking with agents yesterday. Uh, some of those guys are going to be running as well as working out. Uh, the question uh, will be who's run, like who's going to do that. I don't, I don't see Xavier worthy r- running the 40, right? right? There's, there's no reason. However, I do see perhaps JT Sanders trying to better a four, seven. I see, and, but we'll see. I mean, maybe not, maybe he stands on what he's done because he still looks like he's going to be the second tight end off the board. Th- those are questions that I have a little bit of, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll be there live uh, mm-hmm. and in person. Uh, later, and Jerry and I will talk about that uh, following as well, so you can catch some uh, pro day reactions as well. We'll also have it on Twitter too. Christopher Weatherford has a good question. Um, I, I do think it's a huge day for Quinn. I, obviously, the Saturday games matter more for him in year three. But here's the great thing about a pro day: is you know those guys get to see him really up close for an extended period of time. And as many eyes are going to be on him as they are the guys in the draft this year, I guarantee you, um, they know he's throwing today. Um, but it's also a chance to go shake hands and present yourself to guys. Um, so that it's a big day for Quinn. It, it really is because these these 32 teams that are going to be represented today, yeah, they're all there to see the guys in the draft next year. But they know Quinn's throwing. And so it, it's a first chance for him to show, okay, a stronger body. And Sark will be telling those guys he's worked. Look, he's worked on his body. This is what he's doing. He's getting stronger uh, so he can withstand the season better than he could his first two years from a health perspective. And the injury last year against Houston was tough. I mean, uh, JT missed the block against Nelson Caesar, and you're going to get smoked if a tight end missed the block against the NFL edge guy. Uh, So, uh, But I think it's a big day for Quinn. I really do. And I I think he'll perform well. All right, guys, this next question here from Seth. Anything stand out on the newer coaches at practice? Kenny Baker's not shy. I'll put it I'll put it that way. I mean, he is not shy. Uh, hey, hey, Bobby, let's talk about that. That's important because, you know, Bo Davis was a very strong, let's say, communicator. So Kenny Baker, the, the, the coach that comes in after that, it has to be you. That's a strong communication position to me. It, 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 the motor in the defensive line is as as important as any motor at any position in football, and so you have to have a guy uh, at, at the co- that position that can push these guys to maximize their motor on a snap to snap basis in practice and snap and possessions in a game. And that's so vital. I think that's number one for a D line coach. Uh, we've had, we've heard. I've had a guy that trains a bunch of NFL guys say Kenny Baker's a tremendous run game and pass rush coach. But to me, the number one thing is how do you get these guys' motors revved up and keep them revved up? Because it's that's the most important thing in playing that position. And hey, there's some guys you you didn't have to rev up Casey Hampton or Byron Murphy's motor, but those are rare guys. Hey, one of the things we need to talk about is how Kenny Baker even got to Austin. Yeah. Um, so we were told, Jerry and I were part of the same conversation yesterday. Um, and we were told that uh, Kenny Baker in part was hired because of Johnny Nansen uh, and his connections with some guys in the NFL that said Kenny Baker is a good pass rush slash D line coach. Uh, and they wanted to work together. Yep. So Sark, uh, those those are the two new guys on the staff, Nansen and Baker, and they are going to be the ones that try to get after the quarterback. Uh, so I thought it was actually pretty interesting uh, that those two, that, that Nansen actually influenced somewhat uh, the hire of Baker, allegedly. So we'll see how that works out. Um, I, I would also say this, and I, and I mentioned that about Baker not being shy because of what we talked about with Sadir Mitchell almost immediately. We did talk uh, – Another person talked to us about the Nansen. Uh, look, Anthony Hill, for those wondering, uh, Anthony Hill could be the best pass rusher on the team. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they're going to have to find a way to get him into coverage at times. They've got to find a way to create pass rush. Uh, one of the questions that came in t- this morning on the On Texas Football message boards 
is, is there anybody that you think is eight and a half sacks plus or eight sacks plus this, this today, Blake, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I'm bringing it up right now. Yeah. My, my thought on this is I saw multiple guys possible of that yesterday. Um, Trey Moore is a possibility. I think Ethan Burke is a possibility. I think that the, that Anthony Hill could be a possibility if he was a pass rusher, depending on how they deploy that front uh, and how they use it. Uh, so, Jerry, I don't know what you thought. Is there an eight plus sack player on the field? That's oh, a yeah. lot. That's a lot. Uh, Trey, Trey, Trey Moore is for sure. He's too twitchy. The one thing is, the one thing about Trey Moore is, he's not the first guy off the bus. He's not the long, tallest guy. Doesn't have the longest arms, right? But you know what he does? He has twitch for days, and he is understands low man wins. And the lower he is, the more explosive he is. I, I think he's going to be that guy. Um, and he's also got the experience. Uh, I, and I think he's coming in at the right time at Texas uh, with Johnny Nansen coming in. Uh, I, I think Texas is going to be, because of the conference they're going to a little bit as well, I think you're going to see a more aggressive defense at Texas this year. Because you have to be. If you if you cannot ask your defensive backs to cover for that long in the SEC, the athletes are just too good. That doesn't mean all these teams are great, but it means the athletes are a next level. And you can't ask your defensive backs to cover playoff coverage and cover that long. It's that's not a winning formula. You have to get the quarterback to the ground in the SEC. The other thing I would say uh, and add uh, to that is I, I felt. I felt very strongly um, about what I saw from Ethan Burke and Baron Sorrell uh, as well yesterday. I, they've got guys uh, that, that are going to be able to get after the passer a little bit differently than perhaps they have in the past. Uh, that That is very, very apparent in my opinion. All right, guys, let's keep on with that defensive line talk uh, because we have a, or we'll say, Defensive line and sack talk. Let's start with this one from Two Broke to pay attention. Where do you think Anthony Hill will rank in pass rush in the SEC next year? Tough question. Um, I, I need I need a second to think about that. Like the SEC pass rushers coming back. I don't think. Look, I don't think he's going to be the leading pass rusher for no, Texas. No, is the is the issue. So I, how is he rank among the SEC? And I, now that's not to say he couldn't be. He just wouldn't be. At this point, does, does that make sense? I, I think they're going to use Trey Moore more in that regard. Uh, Ethan Burke, Baron Sorrell. Pa- oh, 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 it's, it's a timeout. I'm um, sorry, Bobby. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just found the answer. Uh, no, the James Pierce at Tennessee is the best pass rusher in the country next year. All right. Sorry. I had to throw that out. Go ahead. Bobby. No, that's fair. I mean, I just don't think you're going to have him, have him there uh, at this point in time. I, I don't think you'll have the most at Texas. Unless unless Nansen and Kwiatkowski come up with something intriguing at linebacker and getting after the passer. I, yeah. You know what? That might be a good one. If anybody has a, has the time while we're doing this and we can bring it up later, uh, see what kind of uh, pass rushing stats the linebackers at Arizona had last year. So, so here good. you go. So last year's SEC sack leaders, the top three, there was four guys that had 10. Three of those guys graduated. James Pierce at Tennessee's back, and he's projected – as a first rounder, if not a top 10 type of guy, I think he might be. I was part of a national uh, recruiting uh, rankings team when he came out, and we absolutely loved him out of North, uh, North Carolina. Um, you know, you go down the list, Alabama lost their guys. Uh, Dion Walker, the interior D tackle for Kentucky, who's a projected possible first round pick next year, he had eight sacks from the interior position. Okay, so uh, that's a high number. Um, but really, Princely Uman Milan from Manor, he had seven at Florida last year. He's old Miss this year. What will Walter Nolan look like in year three? It's his contract year. It's a big year for him. So there's some uh, talented pass rushers. Uh, Tyler Barron had six at Tennessee last year, uh, but obviously he's at Louisville now. Uh, but there's some uh, – Landon Jackson had six at Arkansas last year, and he's back. Obviously, Harold Perkins had six sacks at LSU last year. So just some numbers for y'all. But James Pierce is definitely the best pass rusher in the SEC, and I'm not even sure it's going to be close this year. He should probably be a 12 to 14 sack guy if he's healthy. And then we got a couple questions about Colin Simmons. We'll start with this one. Graham Fam Madden says, is Colin running with the twos or the threes? I didn't, I didn't see that. 
they weren't running like that. He was third in line, but that yeah. doesn't mean he's running with the threes. We didn't see we didn't see defense go to team, if that makes sense. No. And then this other question about Colin uh, Britt Rasco says, could he be a Jack? I think that's what they're playing him at playing him out right now. I mean, they they've got Trey Moore um, at boundary. They move. They're moving. Um, they're moving. I think long term he'll be a he'll be a buck. But um, that's a good question, Britt. Uh, I think he could play. E I think Colin could be either. Long term, he's got long enough arms and he's strong enough, and he's going to have the body build to be either. I just think you want him coming off the weak side, most likely, uh, which would be the buck, not the jack. Then we got a couple. Oh, go ahead, Jerry. Real quick, I had a uh, basketball question. Uh, Andre Stoyakovich, son of Paige Stoyakovich, went in the portal from Stanford. Texas actually finished second in that recruitment coming out of high school. But a big reason it was Stanford was mom pushed staying on the West Coast close to home. They have a, a younger sister that plays volleyball. What? Because initially when that recruitment started, there was some chatter that the family might move back uh, to Europe. OK, and that would have changed that recruitment. So I guess I said all that to say this. Somebody's asking if Texas would go after him again. Uh, we'll have to see on that. He didn't have a great freshman year. He had a good freshman year. Right? He's still going to play pro ball long term. It's just going to take him longer. But is UCLA or St. Mary's, If he is he going to make another West Coast decision? Uh, that's what we'll have to see. And then, Jerry, I'm going to since we switched over to basketball, I'm going to go ahead and ask you this one question here. Give us one nugget to help with our bracket, says Too Broke to Pay Attention. Does Sanford pull the upset in the first round? Does Texas make it to the 16, Sweet 16? Will Houston go to the championship game? We need something. Help them out with okay. the so, Texas football bracket challenge. So whatever I say will end up being wrong, but I have issues. I have the same issues with the Houston team as I've had with the majority of Kelvin Sampson's teams. And, and one is how healthy is Tugler for the NCAA tournament, right? That's a big one. Uh, for them as a rim protector, shot blocker, athletic power forward. But my my issue with Houston, they have to get a perfect draw because if they get into a game, and, and Kelvin Sampson is a great coach, he's a Hall of Fame coach. His style of basketball is tremendous in a regular season. It beats you up, it bullies you, it wears you down. He's a tremendous defensive coach, as good as we see in college basketball. But then in the tournament, there comes a time where you have to score 76, 78, 80 points to win a game. They've never been able to do that. Their style of play is a lower possession game, so they need a really good draw. Purdue, I'm not a believer in, but they got a great draw, as my friend Jason Watts said. Be careful. I was talking trash on Twitter about Purdue, but he said be careful because they got a great draw, and he's right. I'm not a believer in Purdue. I, I think Zach Eady's the most overhyped college basketball player I can remember seeing. I mean – if I'm KD and, and TJ, I have a little bit of an issue that they share, that his name's on the Naismith with them uh, because they're much better players. Uh, I, I don't know if Purdue can get it done. Um, I just don't. I don't know when it comes down to it. Uh, if, those, if they can get it done or Houston can get it done, I think UConn's an overwhelming favorite in this tournament. Yeah. But, they have, but they have different pressure because they're trying to win it twice. Hey, do you have a complete different team. pressure? A sleeper team that somebody should be aware of, maybe that can make a, a Cinderella run. Oh gosh, man, this is going to be a crazy tournament. Um, I mean, I you know, Seth Davis had McNeese in the Sweet 16, and that's not nuts to me. I mean, it's not crazy. I mean, you're always betting on these 413, 512 upsets, right? So the first one has to happen, but generally, if the first one happens, the second one can happen. Um, some a lot of people have Sanford over Kansas. I'm definitely not a believer in Kansas this year. I think it's the uh, least talented roster Bill Self's had, and then Kevin McCullough being injured uh, for parts of the season. Um, but you know, can this is this would be the this would be the funny thing about Kansas this year is there's been years where they're a three seed or four seed, and pick, people were picking them to the Final Four, and they get bounced in the first or second round. So this would be the year people don't have any expectations, and they end up in the Sweet 16. But I'm not a believer in Kansas this year at all. All right, guys. Well, Bobby, before we move on, we got a couple of super chats. But before I read those, can you tell folks out there about Rick Bobro and Austin Underground? Yeah, absolutely. Rick's our friend, and he uh, helps uh, run and operate a company called Austin Underground. Uh, Austin Underground helps uh, you in the Austin area uh, with difficult commercial underground installations like large, large pipe, 
projects, underground water, et cetera. He has specialized in this since 2004. The team's engineering background gives Austin Underground the ability to perform work other firms often consider just too risky. Rick and his team offer an end-to-end -end client experience, including seamless communi communication, budgeting, staffing, and top-notch trade partners. So if you're looking for someone to do the dirty work and get it done right, uh, make sure you check out Austin Underground, Rick Vavro and his team. Uh, most importantly, they produce solid quality work each and every time. Uh, Blake, I think St. Mary's, St. Mary's a good pick uh, to make a run. They, I think Randy Bennett's one of the best coaches in the country. Uh, very, they got, they've got a couple of guards that are really good players play really good as a team defensively. Um, and that's, that's a team that rotates for each other that has each other's back on defense on team defense. And, uh, now Gonzaga's down a little this year. So is it making St. Mary's look a little better than they are? Maybe, but I still think St. Mary's a really good team. Well, thank you. I'm glad to hear that, man. <laughs> which means so. we're which means they're going to lose upset yeah, in the first, first round. <laughs> first round bounce. My bracket's screwed. Look, look, look with, the, with with the portal in NCAA basketball outside of UConn, just let your wife pick the teams by colors or something. Just say that's about the same probability. Yeah. All right, guys. Like I said, a couple of super chats. So we're going to start with this one from Rudy. He said, "Hayes, hi, alum here. How come there's never any big prospects in Buddha? Do you remember Connor Lanfear or e Lanfear? Uh, flip to Aggie, my freshman, my freshman year, I was devastated. I, I so I love this question, Bobby, because this is we're going to test our memory, and I can't came up come up with the name. I'm going to see if you can. Hayes had a running back. It was early 2000s? Was it Hardaway? They had a running back. Somebody will know it if you're from Buddha, if you're from that area. Being in Austin, they had a running back. I think was it James Hardaway, who was a really, really good player in the early two thousands. Steve Hardaway. It may have been Stephen Hardaway. I I can't remember. Um, Buda is is uh, look where the real grow Buda has grown. Don't get me wrong, but there are places now. I mean, San Marcos is the team in that corridor now, yes. Jerry, that is starting to get a lot of elite players. Yeah. Um, so, you know, first we'll see uh, what what exactly it does. I mean, I'm not I, I don't know that Hayes Consolidated is, is going to be a place that that ever produces big numbers, whether it's San Marcos. New Braunfels has, has produced some guys over the years, uh, but really that Cibolo Steel down into San Antonio area. Now it's going up to San Marcos, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, San Marcos has a. Uh... They they got a I think they got kind of hosed by the Texas UIL, but that's another story. Uh, but they have four or five Power Five kids in that um, coming up. They had to play JV football last year. That will be making their varsity appearances this year. They have a linebacker and wide receiver uh, that Texas has already had on campus. Guys to watch in that twenty six class. They got some guys. I got. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I'm going to stick up for San Marcos on this. Uh, because people say, you know, they're recruiting players. Who's not? That's my issue. That's my issue with some of these rulings. Who's not? Has anybody ever gone along I-20? <laughs> Come on. Yeah. <laughs> All right, the next super chat here is from Blake. And Blake says, if you had no idea about the background of any of the players, who immediately jumped out to you yesterday? Kelvin Banks, Cameron Williams. Uh, Quinn Ewers, uh, Arch Manning, Ryan Wingo, uh, Aaron Butler looked good, by the way, guys. Forgot there, to mention shifty. him. He's shifty. Um, John Tay a little bit. Amari Nyblack would be on the top five list of that. Uh, uh, Isaiah Bond. I mean, dude, I'm telling you, when I – three years ago, four years ago, I went out to a Texas practice, and I looked around, and I saw – in the the upper class, I saw two, three, maybe four guys. I mean, when you, I love Brendan Schooler, okay, but he was one of the top guys on that team that ended up in the NFL, right? I, this is just a totally different category right now. When you guys go out and watch practice or you go to the spring game, it's not oh, can he eventually be somebody? It's like how good can he eventually be? It's yeah. a different question. I mean, before we were saying. Could he ever make the NFL? Now, 
there's not a lot of kids on the roster that can't make the NFL. They just have to prove it. That's the that's the categorical difference. Um, uh, somebody asking about Jelani McDonald. I mentioned him earlier. I thought he and Derek Williams to again just look physically so different than every other safety out there. I mean, they're just so long. Um, and uh, Derek Williams looked like that. That would be another one that just put it on the the list. Derek Williams. I would add uh, Anthony Hill to that list of just guys that look different uh, than everybody else. There's several. I mean, uh, Texas is loaded. I would not be surprised if Texas right now, and I and I tried to count it up this morning and, or last night actually, and then finished it up this morning. I think there's 30 plus NFL players on this Texas roster. Agree. I mean, I'll say this about Johnny McDonald. If you're talking about the top five guys, the best five looking guys in a uniform at Texas at their what you're supposed to look like at a certain position or exceeding that, Jelani McDonald's one of those guys for me. I posted photos on On Texas Football and a little video this morning on texasfootball.com in the practice uh, day one thread I I put up yesterday. Just go look at Jelani McDonald physically. I mean, he is a top five guy in the program. Uh, If you were drawing up a football prospect at different positions, he would be one of those five. Long but long arm, long arms, but strong arms, perfectly proportioned body. Um, man, he looks really good. If his play, if his upside play equals the what he looks like, Texas is gonna have a hell of a player long term. I guess we got another super chat from Football Junkie. Thank you, Football Junkie. 40 times for Jeff Bush and Ford today. Heard Bush might be faster. That may not be wrong. I mean, Jet Bush is a good player that was – I mean, he wasn't as good as, as Jalen Ford, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, I, I thought Jet Bush played hard. Um, and I don't know that speed is necessarily Jalen Ford's calling card, right? So th- there could be guys that are faster that aren't as good, et cetera. Uh, but Jet Bush played hard at Texas. Uh, I'm, I'm rooting for him. Today, just like I'm rooting for everybody that played at Texas today. And then Somebody's asking about Colin Simmons' weight. He's probably 235. He looks good, guys. Yeah. For his age. That, yeah, just mark that one down. Zena looks good. <laughs> Zena looks tremendous. Oh, physically. God. I mean, they, they've got I, – when, when I say 30, I, I should share this list. I don't want to because I don't want to put pressure on the, on the guys. You know what I mean, Jerry? You don't want to put undue pressure on some of the young kids. But I actually came up with 32 that I think better than 50-50 odds, in my opinion, as long as they continue to produce. That's 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 going to be as many as as, 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 Georgia may have more than Texas. Ohio State may have more than Texas. I don't know if anybody else will in the country. Hey, bring up David Keith Williams' comment on Colin Simmons because I I want to uh, comment on that. So – he was listed at 230 as a recruit, but he was actually about 218, uh, I think, when he was at the Under Armour All-America game in December. So he had dropped a lot of weight. He might have even gotten down those low as 215 his senior year at some point. So he has put on 15, 20 pounds. I think at one point they said he was 235. So, yeah, I think he was just a little smaller than his listed weight in high school. Hey, y'all, we just got the uh, pro day list from Texas. Oh, yeah. Xavier Worthy, Jatavion Sanders, Mitchell Watts, Keelan Robinson, Whittington, Brooks, Sanborn, Ford, Bush, Christian Jones, Byron Murphy, and Andre Sweat. All of them gonna gonna be there. I I don't know. I talked to Sweat a little bit. I don't know exactly all of what he's going to do tomorrow. I asked I asked him that point blank. He goes, I'm still not sure. This was yesterday in the parking lot. So <laughs> be be aware of that. We don't yeah. know for sure what he's doing today. Yeah. There you go. All right, y'all, we have time for just another question or two. And uh, Tyler Rolo says, would you say Nye Black looks similar to Kyle Pitts when he was at Florida, his build, his speed? He kind of looks similar to me. Not as tall. Yeah. What what, what did Pitts come in at, Jerry? Uh, Kyle Pitts, uh, we had him in the Under Armour game. I'm pretty sure he was 6'5 without yeah. shoes. Nye Black looks 6'4", 6'3 and a half, 6'4". Yes. Uh, yes. But maybe fast, definitely faster than Pitts, in my opinion. 
maybe does not have the catch radius of Pitts. Uh, he has long arms, but Pitts has ultra long arms, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, but snags yeah. the ball. I mean, uh, hey, Bobby, uh, so Kyle Pitts, 6'5 and 5'8 without shoes on it. So he's a two inches taller yeah. um, with longer arms. I mean, that's not a good comp. That's not a good comp for Amari Nyblack. A, a good comp for Amari Nyblack is Bo Scaife. But yeah, a it's thinner, a great one, Bobby. But, but a thinner Bo Scaife. It's a great one. A boat before the knee injuries, which Texas never got to see. Texas yeah. fans. I mean, that's a Bobby. That's a great comp for an eye black. Bo Scaife pre ACLs, he returned kickoffs, played running back. He did whatever in high school coming out of Colorado. That's a great comp. He's faster than Bo. Yeah, and but he's the same kind of smooth as Bo. Yeah. All right, y'all. This will be the last question for this morning, and it's from Phil. What are the chances that Texas? Texas and Georgia, the game, both with two teams with undefeated records. You got to bring up Georgia's schedule to see if they're going to be undefeated. Give me just oh, a second. no, you don't. They're going to be undefeated. <laughs> Come on. I, I think that, it up. <laughs> I did that for Bobby. <laughs> uh, Georgia's, Georgia is so loaded. Um, so, so loaded. Uh, I would I, I worry about Texas being undefeated at that point more than I do Georgia. Um, not just – and it's not – you know, with me, Jerry, it's interesting. I'm not – like, I'm not super worried about Michigan. Maybe I should be, and it's going to end up being like uh, they're going to somehow keep Texas completely in check on defense. Uh, but look, I mean, hey. I, I guess they have Alabama early and Jalen Milrow. That's going to, but that's going to be a revenge game for them. Dabo said, don't call it a comeback. Oh, uh, give right. me a break. <laughs> that Dabo still, I mean, I, we'll see what. Garrett Riley does in second in his second year as offensive coordinator at Clemson because that offense is does take a little time to install. So we'll see what that kind what Garrett Riley is able to do at Clemson. But other than that, I just don't see I don't see Auburn giving them a problem. Uh, Kentucky they've do, they dominated Kentucky so bad in a, yeah it's uh, a bad matchup for Kentucky. It's, it's horrible. Matchup. Yeah, because it's it's strength on strength and they ain't got what Kentucky they ain't got what Georgia does. Alabama is interesting because that's the that's a replay of the the SEC championship game that Jalen Milrow uh, took away from them basically. So I I think Georgia will pay, have payback. I they'll be five and zero, oh, six and zero, oh, whatever that is, walking into to DKR. I'll say this: if Georgia is six and zero oh on that schedule, they're a real deal because that that is a more challenging first half of schedule than Georgia's played in a while. Yeah. Well, they got two legit top five teams or top ten teams. Yep. In uh, Clemson and, and uh, Alabama. So what about Texas? Um, I I would not put even I would put even money on Texas being undefeated through that first group of teams, and that that's it has a lot to do with they're going into a conference that they're not used to playing in, um, and going on the road to Michigan. I look, Michigan graduates so heavily this year; they are. They basically have to re reproduce their entire offense or recreate their entire offense. Um, their defense has left some studs, there's no doubt. But they lost all of those guys too. Uh, they lost all the coaching staff off of that. I I just think that uh, Texas is going to be – Texas should beat Michigan in Ann Arbor, in my opinion. I don't know that they will. You know, and so then it comes down to – how well do, do the tech does the tech do the Texas receivers and Quinn Ewers and how quickly do they get on the same page? Uh, and whether or not Texas can stop, you know, opposing teams this year. I, I'm I'm 50 50 on Texas being undefeated at that point in time in the season. Uh, well, my, my thing with Michigan is Mason Grant going to be the first player coach at the defensive line position. Because <laughs> right now he's probably instructing the guys uh, getting ready for spring practice, but. Look, I think it's. I think last year with when Texas went to Tuscaloosa, we talked. It was a great time and year to play at Alabama. I think it's the same, and and I agree with Bobby. The two D linemen are potential first rounders. Colton Loveless is the best tight end in the country. Will Johnson's the top ten type of pick at corner, right? If all those guys return, uh, they they have and their D line. There's some young guys like Trey Pierce who Texas tried to recruit late. He's a future NFL draft pick. They got some depth on the defensive front at Michigan, so they're gonna they're gonna challenge 
uh, that inside zone. And then Michigan, you know, you're going to come right at Texas here. You're going to stop the run because they're going to have a young quarterback or a transfer quarterback. But I think it sets up for Texas to win that game, uh, assuming there's no major injuries, you know, in spring or early in fall camp. I think it's a great year to play early in the season at Michigan. Um, and then OU, I like I like where OU game is because it's going to be – if Texas doesn't have a little revenge on their mind for last year, uh, then you never will uh, because Texas knows that they were a better team than Oklahoma last year. Oklahoma played better that day. And I think it's a great year to play. I Like I said, this schedule sets up really well and the season sets up really well for Sark as a coach. Um, I think there's, you know, you almost climb the mountaintop. You don't get there. Um, you got a lot to prove still to, to try to get to that mountaintop. It's a great year to be Sark because, and that includes the guys that came in from Alabama. There's three guys from Alabama that transferred to Texas that have a very nasty taste in their mouth, losing that ga- overtime game to Michigan in the semifinals. So they have a little something left too uh, in their final year of college football. So I think Sark's in a great spot. I think it's a great, Time to play Michigan, game two, even if it's a road game. And then I think Oklahoma sets up well for Texas this year because Sark won't have to – he won't have to worry about saying we played great against those guys and blew them out. All right, y'all. Well, that's going to do it for today's episode of Coffee and Football presented by Rick Balvaro and Austin Underground. Now, you guys will be back after the pro day. No, no. We're going to go before the pro day with state of the program. Uh, Jerry and I are going to go over – uh, to to campus here in a second, uh, and also visit with CJ Vogel and bring him in. Uh, and Jerry and he and I want to do a little bit of a roundtable on yesterday's practice because the three of us haven't been on together to kind of pitch stuff off of one another. So that's what we're going to do for the state of the program this week. Uh, we'll do that over. I think we're going to try to tape it close to uh, the uh, uh, where they're going to be doing pro day today, and then we're back after that for pro day as well. And uh, so we got a, a wall-to-wall coverage for the Longhorns uh, today as well. So if you haven't already, there's no better time to hit that like and subscribe button and then ring the bell so you're notified anytime the guys go live today or post a video, whatever it may be, and in the future, obviously, as well. So be sure to do that if you haven't already. And then head on over to ontexasfootball.com for continuous Longhorn coverage around the clock. Uh, and one last plug here for the On Texas Football Bracket Challenge. You can head to that link there on the banner and uh, join. And then the winner, $200 worth of apparel <laughs> from 40 Acres Apparel. So we want to thank them for sponsoring that. We also want to thank Rick Volvo and Austin Underground, Factor and Autograph for sponsoring today's show. Thank you all for tuning in for the super chats and for the, the great questions and comments. Jerry, you got something. I, the way to end this show, bring up David Keith Williams' comment at 926. That's perfect way to end this show. Being obsessed is the best way to beat Alabama. And Sark is Alabama. Alabama. Excuse me. I saw the AMA at the end, and my mind put Alabama together. Oklahoma. If you if you don't think Oklahoma wasn't obsessed to beat Texas last year, that's a great way to end the show. I agree. So for Bobby Burton and Jerry Hamilton, I'm Blake Monroe, and we'll see you tomorrow morning. <laughs>